to welcome you tonight to our uh, January study. It's great to see all of you here. We've got a good crowd, and people are continuing to come in, and we're getting some chairs set up for you. We don't want that, you to have to stand in the back. Um, as I mentioned to you tonight, our special guest is Albert Bisson. He is the um, uh, head of the undergraduate program of the philosophy department at Mississippi State University. Um, he is from Sturgis, and you'll be able to tell that as soon as he begins talking <laughs> that he's from Sturgis. And so, uh, Albert, if you'll just share a little bit about your background. Sure, yeah. Um, we've been here in the States for about 24 years. We <laughs> <laughs> From Sturgis, from Sturgis. All our time in, in Mississippi. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I consider myself a redneck. Uh, <laughs> We, we have the ubiquitous cars that aren't working in our yard. Uh, three of them, by the way. <laughs> uh, dogs that chase the mailman. Um, and, uh, and snakes and all the rest of it. But no, we came over here uh, back in 94 to do some studies at the seminary. And the intention was to be here for about three years and then go back to the UK and pastor a church. But as it turned out, we ended up uh, remaining here and uh, are quite settled uh, Two of our children, we have three, uh, were born here in Mississippi, one in Jackson, right in the heart of the state, another one here in uh, Starkville itself. So Rebecca Joy was born in Jackson and Sarah Grace here in Starkville. My son Daniel, um, he was born in the UK, about three and a half years old when he came here, and uh, he had the perfect English accents until he met a lad from Alabama. <laughs> Overnight, it was weyer and deyer and cheyer. <laughs> It was a losing battle. If I talk about myself as a redneck, he's triply a redneck. <laughs> but um, he's since um, become an American citizen. He joined the Army National Guard, and his intent was to become an officer, uh, for which he needed ultimately to be a, a citizen. So he, he became a full American citizen, and now he's uh, serving as a police officer uh, down in Biloxi, uh, and thoroughly enjoying that and thinking of going back into the Guard itself. Uh, he's a graduate, of course, of that great university just down the road, Mississippi State. Uh, he graduated in finance, and uh, Rebecca Joy's just completed her studies this December. She did a double major in uh, philosophy and English. You know, a third child following the right path, path is also on their way to Mississippi State. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Mm. Um, you'll notice that on the screen there is a number that you can text a question to. Uh, several of you have submitted questions already, and so I'm going to be asking Albert the questions that have been submitted. Now, just for your information, this is not my personal cell phone number. It's uh, Bobby's. And so <laughs> when you text the question, it's going to go to Bobby, and then Bobby is going to send the question in to me. Uh, and we're going to try to get to as many of your questions as we possibly can in the hour that we have. But let's go ahead and begin. One question that has been submitted to us tonight is the question, why should I read the Bible? Hmm. Well, the Bible is indeed the revelation of God himself. And um, you know, he's the fundamental reality of the world in which we live, of the entire cosmos itself. And uh, the scriptures talk about us being made in the image of God. And when we begin to consider that, it has profound implications. And especially in our contemporary postmodern society where um, people are very much concerned about their own identity. Who am I? Uh, what kind of a person am I? What makes me tick? And so on. And uh, the typical process to try and answer that question is to look inward, uh, to try and self-identify in some way or look at others who are so-called experts who might be able to provide some insight. But invariably, that can lead to some degree of frustration. The scriptures provide a revelation of our God and declare that we are made in his image. And the healthy and biblical approach to comprehending who we are is to see ourselves in relation to God himself. Uh, we come to know ourselves by knowing God and understanding how he has established us in our humanity to uh, live, and that is in relation, in relation to him and in relation to others. And with that outward perspective, there is a healthy psychology and an enormous benefit because we see God in his perfection, not ourselves in our imperfection, and thereby we become more aware of what intrinsically characterizes our humanity, not the depravity of human society, which is all too evident and distressing, but the perfection of our God, and thereby we have a context to understand his, 
his relation to us, and his redemptive work. So if you want to know who you are, if you want to know the significance and the purpose of this entire world and of life itself, then the scriptures answer these fundamental existential questions. What an excellent answer. And questions, by the way, are coming in at a rapid pace. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you say that we were answering these questions? <laughs> so let, let's, let's get to a, um, I think let's get to a question that probably everybody has, and then we'll get into some nuts and bolts questions. Mm -hmm. But one of the questions that a lot of people have has to do with um, how the Bible, how the books in the Bible were selected. Mm -hmm. And so how do we know that it's true? How are all these Bibles put, uh, the books in the Bible put together? Mm -hmm. So how would you answer that question? Well, the, the scriptures were, were built up over a considerably long period of time, and scholars in their academic endeavors have various ideas about the nature and composition of the scriptures. But if we take it fairly straightforwardly, uh, they are uh, records of events that took place, of revelations that were given, of prophetic words that were uh, given to prophets to declare to the people of God. And with the Old Testament scriptures, it was over hundreds of years that the body of material was built up until it eventually became settled uh, as a fixed body, a canon as it's technically known, um, around the early part of the second century AD. Uh, and that became absolutely essential with the changes that had taken place in Israel during the first century and then into the second century. Uh, in the first century, there was uh, an uprising uh, inspired by a group of nationalists called Zealots, uh, which the Romans uh, put down quite easily and destroyed Jerusalem and uh, in time uh, began to suppress further uh, the Jews. And uh, that really drove home the necessity of, of, of fixing uh, the canon. But the canon had already been established. It was just making it absolutely certain. Mm. With regard to the uh, later scriptures, so you have the Gospels, the uh, Book of Acts, and then the Epistles, and then ultimately uh, the uh, Letter of Revelation, the uh, uh, Apocalypse of, of, of John. Uh, the, these writings are built up over time. Uh, the Gospels typically would be traced to the first century, where there would be witnesses who could validate this material. Um, and then uh, the epistles also written in the first century, all the material ultimately in the first century. But over time, uh, the church would recognize the value of these various uh, items that had been uh, written. And uh, there was a general consensus within the church that this is the word of God. Now, there were writings that were outside of what we would call the scriptures that were of some uh, encouragements to the church, such as the shepherd of Hermas, but those which were um, eventually established as the authoritative revelation of God were uh, settled fairly early on. Um, the earliest record we have of um, a canon, of a collection of New Testament books, goes back to the second century, called the Moratorian uh, Canon. But it really is by the fourth century uh, that there is a definitive statement about what constitutes the collection of New Testament books as we would have it today. But that doesn't mean to say that it took to the fourth century to do that. The books were already uh, recognized and uh, regarded as of great significance. The basic rule of thumb was this, that uh, a, a book to be accepted had to be written by uh, an apostle or someone who knew an apostle. And therefore, it would uh, be consistent with the apostolic teaching. That is, the instruction that Christ gave, which his disciples absorbed and practiced, and which they passed on to the church. And on that basis, uh, the church was able to dismiss uh, various writings that were evidently not written by the apostles. So there were writings written by people called Gnostics, who had a mystical view of, of Christianity. And uh, every now and then, today, you hear people discovering a new book, a lost book of the Bible, but those books were never really lost. They were well known, but they were just not included because they were inconsistent with the apostolic message. Mm. So. Yep, mm. great question. Um, a, a question that's, that's been submitted, um, we have lots of university students who are in the room. So for a university student with a busy schedule, they have lots of homework. You, you never hear that, do you? No. Um, lots of homework and very, tests and those strange. kind of things. What are some tips that you would give a university student of making time to get into the Word? Hmm. Right, okay, well, that's an interesting question. Um, I would put it differently. I would not want to conceive of this in terms of making time, but rather to have all the time with a focus upon the Lord. 
Uh, the scriptures direct us to be in fellowship with God always. Rejoice in the Lord always. Pray, constantly pray always. Um, we are to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice of, of worship to our God. Um, and we are in a real relationship with the living God, uh, filled with the Spirit of God. And um, the, 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 the most helpful way to conceive of our relation is to be thinking about the Lord all the time, uh, meditating upon his word all the time, praying all the time, being careful all the time to live in a manner that's consistent with the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so then we're not constrained by thinking, I've got to put some time in to, to spend alone with the Lord because you're always with the Lord. And remember how uh, in the scriptures, uh, the great hope that God presented to Israel through Isaiah is that God is Emmanuel. He is with us. Think about the Great Commission where Jesus Christ directs his disciples to go into all the world and to proclaim the gospel. And in, at the end of that statement uh, he, that he made to his church, Matthew chapter 28, he says, and lo, I am with you always to the end of time. Now, there's a lot more that I can say on this, and perhaps I, I'll, I'll run on a little bit further. But to make this work in practice, uh, what one ought ideally to do is to have some passage of Scripture in mind always and to be thinking about that passage of Scripture. So you're drawing out the, the juices, the nourishments, um, the revelation that God is making of himself in that Scripture. It's not a matter of... Um, covering a fixed quantity of material or getting through the Bible in a year or two years or whatever it may be, but rather it's a matter of, 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 of absorbing who God is, taste and see that the Lord is good, and to be bringing the word into the actuality of our lives, into the very manner in which we live, the very way in which we think, the very way in which we speak, the very way in which we react. And these are circumstances that characterize our entire day. It's a living God, a living religion, and we are in fellowship with him. So, you know, in that regard, think about living for the Lord always. Think that you are never alone, that he's always with you. Think that you are an ambassador of Jesus Christ. So the very word that you've internalized and are meditating upon and being transformed by is expressed to those around you. As the Apostle Paul says, follow my example as I follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So you are a living, bodily worshiper of the living God. Now, if you want to spend time... <laughs> In specific study, then you could do that. Just find time to do it. But make sure that the mainstay of your life is constantly thinking about the Lord. Because your mind as a student never stops working. And what's in your mind will dictate how you see yourself and how you engage with others. So keep the law before you always. That's a great point. And I, mm. I think, um, you know, what I, what I hear him saying is sometimes, and we're all guilty of this. Everybody's guilty of, we don't mean to say it this way, but it's almost as if we say, how do I fit God into my life when God, all of our life belongs to him? That's exactly. a great point. Yeah. If, and if I can say something just from a practical standpoint, and this is, this is just me. You know, there's uh, many different approaches to the study of the scripture. We'll talk about that in a minute. But for me, um, to his point, what I like to do is to, to read a passage. Generally, I don't like to read more than a, a chapter unless I'm doing a read the Bible through a year study, which will require more than a chapter. But I like to, to find one verse that really stands out to me in the chapter and write that down and then meditate on the verse throughout the day, which is kind of what he was saying. This morning, for instance, the verse that I was reading was in Joshua chapter 6, and it said at the end of chapter 6, and this is after Joshua and the Israelites go into the land of Canaan, they march around the city of Jericho, and the walls fall down. And the last verse in chapter 6 says, And the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land. And so that was the verse that I really felt that the Lord had laid on my heart today. And my meditation of that through the day was, yeah, the Lord was with Joshua. But remember, Joshua was being faithful to God, right? I mean, God told Joshua to go into the land after Moses passed away. And it was a fearful thing for him to do, but he was willing to do it. He obeyed. And then when it came to the city of Jericho, he told him to march around the city for seven days, which is quite an unusual battle plan. But Joshua did just as God told him to do. And so as Joshua is new in his leadership, <clears throat> excuse me, God is the one who is endorsing, if you want to say that, Joshua's leadership over the people. Um, as Joshua obeys God, God is working through him. But that's an example of, that's just 
a verse, you know, that I wrote that verse down and meditated on that verse throughout the day. So I guess what I'm hearing you say is it's not about, sometimes we have a belief that um, because we have heard somebody on a podcast who reads 18 chapters a day, that we need to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and we need to read 18 chapters a day before we begin our day. And that's not <clears throat> necessarily, that's fine if you want to do that, but as he said, it's seeing your whole day as belonging to God and meditating on God throughout the day and allowing Him to speak to you and shape your life through the Word. Indeed. Yeah, right. Um, another question, and i say another, there's, there's a lot. <laughs> um, question probably a lot of people have, and I'll just read this one um, verbatim. I don't always understand what I'm reading in the Bible. So where should I start, and how do I go about figuring out what it means? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one simple uh, help in that regard is to uh, have a commentary. Um, and there are a number of commentaries available. A commentary is basically um, a body of work written by someone who has given considerable time and thought to the study of Scripture and brings a degree of maturity and experience to that study and carefulness so that uh, the exposition, the explanation of that scripture is carefully and consistently worked out. And there are a number of uh, commentaries that can help in that regard. Um, the ones I tend to prefer are ones of an of a earlier generation than our particular generation. And um, my preference in that regard is because uh, these older commentators tend to uh, bring a depth of understanding and insight into who God is and who we are in relation to God and how we are to live before God. They're not just simply given tidbits, but rather they're, they're providing uh, an in-depth in insight into the significance of, of the text of Scripture so that it doesn't just sort of fill us with knowledge but moves us to respond to God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so there are commentaries like Matthew Henry's commentary, uh, which is an extensive commentary. You can get that for free. Uh, it's, it's out of copyright because he was around in the uh, turn of the uh, 17th century and then into the 18th century and others finished off his work. And it's, a, it's available in, in a concise form and in a, a less concise form, uh, more detail to it. Uh, but he provides a very careful and applicable uh, uh, analysis of the text to the end that a person may understand what it is to live for and to love, love God. But that kind of uh, writing is not something that you can just sit down uh, and look at and, and simply assimilate in five minutes. It takes a little bit of time to digest. But like most things that require effort in preparation or effort in, in engagement, the returns are considerable for someone who seriously wants to understand what the scriptures are teaching. Because in order to understand the Bible, and I can understand why a person might find this difficult, but to, in order to understand the Bible, you have to know the totality of the Bible. Uh, you need to know the breadth and the depth of the scriptures in order to understand the individual passages of scriptures and understand them within their context, local context, and their broad context. Who can do that? unless you have been able to devote uh, years and years of your life to the study of the scriptures. And so if one's trying to wrestle with the understanding of texts, some are plain and some are not quite so plain, then the uh, learning of saints who have gone before us can be immensely helpful in, in, in understanding the text. Um, there are other authors as well. Uh, once again, someone from uh, the end of the uh, 19th century, J.C. Ryle, has written a commentary on the Gospels. And uh, he's a man of profound uh, learning. He was the first bishop of Liverpool in England. I'm not promoting my own country, but I just have to know this guy. <laughs> uh, um, uh, but he writes plainly and straightforwardly. And his, his um, commentary on the, on the Gospels, called Expository Thoughts on the Gospels, also available free on the internet nowadays, um, was written for families and their family devotions because he wanted to encourage the folk in Liverpool to come around the Word of God and to come around the Word of God together. Uh, and this speaks to another matter which I perhaps we'll elaborate upon at another point. But to, to, come, to come around the Word together, to read it and to study it and to answer questions like we're doing now, 
so that the whole family may grow in their knowledge and understanding. And he writes very plainly, very simply, and it's more bite-sized, so to speak. Um, and those uh, tools can be of enormous help. There are more modern writers that you could uh, no doubt uh, dig out, but those in particular I've always found to be very rich and, and deep. Remember, uh, in our present day, we are used to, to things being quick, things fitting in, things being instant. You can't do that with relationships. I mean, if you try and force a relationship, well, I'm going to give you uh, half an hour, and then uh, I've got to do something else, we'll never get very far. You know, we have to spend time, we have to listen, we have to get to know, and so on. So time spent in study in that kind of way would provide a rich return for someone who's interested. Uh, excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. And point, just to reinforce, is that, you know, we have a relationship with God, and relationships take time. And so, you know, just imagine with your spouse, if you said, okay, I'm, I'm going to give you 10 minutes in the morning and that's it. You know, that's, you're not going to have a very good relationship. And so taking time to learn about God and allow God to teach you about you, that's, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Um, for a new believer who's never really read the scripture before, would you have a recommendation on uh, a book or maybe an order of books to begin with? Sure. And why? Uh, yeah. Um, well, clearly, I think it would be helpful to to begin in the New Testament. The Old Testament is, is absolutely indispensable to the understanding of Scripture. But um, as a new Christian, um, having come to faith in Christ, then you need to keep your focus upon the one in whom you've put your trust, that's mm. Jesus Christ. Mm. And the revelation of Christ is quite prominent within the New, new Testament. And so I'd, I'd encourage you to look at uh, one of the Gospels. Um, and uh, John's gospel is, is very popular in this regard because it has a focus upon the later ministry of Christ, and one gets to see a great deal about the heart of Christ in relation to the Father and in relation to his disciples and in relation to others whom he interacts with. And as a believer in Jesus Christ, he is the one to whom we look for the direction of how to live before God and before others. And a thoughtful uh, reading of, of John's gospel will help you to see how Jesus Christ lived and therefore how you ought to live before God. And indeed, if the Spirit of God is truly in you, then the very life that you're looking at in the life of Christ will be reflected in you as you seek to walk in line with Jesus Christ. And such you know, tender and important uh, lessons borne out in that particular gospel, for example, uh, Jesus washes his disciples' feet. And he says, you know, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And one of the, you know, prime and potent characteristics of the Christian testimony is the love that we have for God and the love that we have for one another. Now, it's easy to profess a love for God but what about my love for you, my brother, my sister in Christ? What about my love for you who are a little bit different for me or maybe a little bit difficult for me to, to get to know or to relate to? But it's in those relations that I prove the reality of God's work in transforming my life from living in sin to living for him. And John's gospel very much brings us face to face with the tenderness of our Lord Jesus Christ, with the instruction of our Christ, with regard to the love of God and the love of one another. He even goes so far as to make some astounding statements, like, uh, this, I can do nothing apart from the Father. And in our present day, that rattles our cage, because we live in such a, a society where we uh, uphold the idea of independence and self-sufficiency, and independence and self-sufficiency militates violently against the expression of Christianity. For we actually... Uh, fulfill the calling of God as we yield ourselves to him and as we present ourselves before others, not as superior, but as their servants, as our Lord Jesus Christ indeed did. And John's gospel very much brings that out. And these are key elements to our Christian life. It's not a matter of the mere accumulation of knowledge, but rather the expression of the truth about Jesus Christ. Of course, the other gospels work very well too in bringing these things out. Luke's gospel uh, shows a lot of relations between Jesus and women and, and Jesus and uh, some of the outcasts uh, within society. And I think it gives us good insight into the further relations that Jesus has and which sets the example for us in our relations with others. 
And then as you uh, mature on in the faith, begin to read uh, the epistles. But before you get there, read the book of Acts and sweep it through very quickly. Uh, don't focus in on all the fine details. You won't be able to work them out, but get the general sense of what's going on and then begin to work through into the epistles. One final thing I think perhaps should say on all of this is that when reading the gospel, uh, try and read large passages at a time. The word of God is not mystical. It's It's written in a way that we can readily comprehend, but it's written in the same manner in which we communicate. We don't communicate in individual words or just a sentence. We communicate in in sentences and in paragraphs, and the sense of what we're trying to express comes across as we read in that way. And so with the the Gospels and the New Testament letters, read large portions of them, read the whole, and then go back over it, having grasped the entire sort of uh, picture of the letter and then begin to chew over uh, what's expressed there. And if you do that, you'll stand with the saints in glory. Mm, Wonderful, Mm. wonderful. And you made a great point about, um, again, it comes back to relationship. And I think a lot of the, the, Mm. I think a lot of the problems that sometimes we have in reading scripture is oftentimes we come to scripture asking the question, what? When in fact, we should be asking the question, who? Exactly right. God, who are you? Mm -hmm. And, and, how do I need to adjust my life in, in light of that? And so it's a great point. You mentioned a minute ago Old Testament. Now, there are always people who say, don't need to read the Old Testament. Old Testament is just irrelevant. So what, what would you say to a, because I'm sure no one here would say that. So if somebody were to say that to them, what would they say in response? Right. Well, that takes us back to a more fundamental point, and that is what, is, what are the Scriptures? And the Scriptures are first and foremost a revelation of God. That God is revealing who he is by what he declares of himself, uh, what he actually brings about in this world, and how he responds to mankind. The scriptures are not about me so much as they are about him. Hmm. And the totality of his revelation stretches across the entire body of the scriptures. And so to annex off a part of the scriptures and say, well, this is really the heart of the scriptures because they they speak about Jesus, which indeed the New Testament does, is to negate the vast volume of material that forms the foundation for the New Testament and which completes the revelation of who God is. And so if you are to comprehend who God is, it is essential that you, you, you see the entirety of the revelation that he has given. Now some people like to make a distinction between God as he reveals himself in the Old Testament and God as he reveals himself in the New Testament and they uh, will assert that God in the Old Testament is full of wrath because of all these judgments and all this terrible stuff that goes on. But the God of the New Testament is a God of love and of grace and of mercy. Well, when one reads the scriptures as a whole, what one comes to see is that God is holy. He's set apart from mankind and yet he condescends to come into this world and minister to man in all the the filth and mess of his sin to raise sinners up and place them upon a firm footing which is Jesus Christ himself and to cause us to give ourselves to him wholeheartedly. This stands so prominent in the Old Testament because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now in our present day Fear is seen as a negative and unhelpful emotion. In the scriptures, uh, fear is presented as an emotional response to God, which is essential to walking humbly and rightly before God. And uh, God manifests himself in his almightiness in such a way as to put us in our place and see our right relation to him, not in order to crush us or destroy us or squash our our, our personalities, but rather that we might receive from him, that we might not stand in our pride and our arrogance. And the Old Testament brings this out quite forcefully in relation to the almightiness of God. And perhaps in our present day, um, we need to be reminded that our God is a holy God, that he's set apart from sin. And one of the distressing aspects of Christianity that gives the the world much cause to, to mock is the immorality is the lack of conviction, is the lack of dedication to God. And um, seeing this played out over the entire Old Testament narrative is essential to the fulfillment of our full-orbed view of who God is and who we are in relation to him. And then you will find that in the New Testament, the strands of the Old Testament are picked up. 
So Jesus Christ says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. In other words, be holy as God is holy. Peter picks it up in his epistle. Be holy as God is holy. And you can understand what that means when you know the Old Testament. Furthermore, the whole nature of the sacrificial system lays the foundations for the necessity and the effectiveness of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now, to go through the Old Testament, you need help. (laughs) Uh, But this is an important part of the study of Scripture. We don't stand as individuals. God has given to his church pastors and teachers, those whom he has set aside so they may devote themselves to the study of his word and to prayer and thereby embrace and encapsulate the scriptures in how they live out their lives. And, and such ones as appointed by God become helps to enable the rest of us to comprehend the message of scripture. So it is essential to a complete understanding of who God is. That's correct. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned uh, a few moments ago about family. Mm-hmm. And so one of the questions has to do with couples. How do you... Uh, do you have any recommendations for couples who want to read the Bible together or families who want to read the Bible together? What mm. would you say? Okay. Um, let me take a step back on that one yep. as well. Um, a couple, one would assume, are going to church together. Mm. And uh, typically, they will receive the ministry of the Word in the morning and they'll receive the ministry of the Word in the evening. And one of the best ways for a couple to engage is to discuss the very sermon that has been preached mm to discuss its relevancy to their own lives and to discuss its relevancy to their relationship and, their rele- and the relevancy of, of, of that ministry to their, their family life and all other aspects of their lives. And so there you have a natural and repetitive input that provides a focus that they've both been exposed to uh, from someone who has given time to study and apply the word of God. And, uh, and, and that, that could fit in very easily because you, know, you can spend time in the, in, the, in the journey home, you can spend time on the, on, on the Sunday, on the Lord's Day, you can spend time in the week rediscussing that. In addition to that, you can read the scriptures together, should you please, um, uh, morning or evening or at some other time. It depends on the nature of your relationship. But at the very, very least, there is the ministry of the, words, of the Lord's word each Sunday. And... Uh, Chip didn't sort of prime me up for this, but, <laughs> but, but the reality is your pastor will have spent time studying the scriptures, seeking to grasp hold of what those scriptures mean, and then trying to work out how can I best present this word to the people whom God has given me to pastor, to, to, to bring to Christ, to, to reveal Christ to. And thought has gone into this, and in the very proclamation of that word, and this is God's gift to you. It's God's gift to couples. It's God's gift to families. And, um, and there you have now insight into the word of God by a man whom God has chosen to study his word and to present his word. And this would form a very natural focus for couples and, and, and for families, in addition to anything else that you wish to do, which you could read scriptures, you could listen to sermons, and so on and so forth. But I would say at the minimum, do that. Yeah, great. That's a great answer. Um, a, a lot of times people ask a question regarding Bible translations. Mm. You ah. know, what's a, what's, what's a uh. translation that's uh, closest to the original text? What's a translation that's better for a beginner to read? How would you answer those questions? Sure, yeah. right. You might think, coming from England, that my favorite Bible translation <laughs> is the King James. <laughs> uh, I'm going to disappoint you. <laughs> um, the, the scriptures are written to, uh, to convey you know, the knowledge of God and in particular the person of Christ. And it's a narrative. It's a narrative that takes various different writing styles. It's, it's straightforward in that prose or it may be poetry or it may be a special t- type of writing called apocalyptic or it may be another kind of communication called parables. Um, it's written in different ways but it's communication. Um, And as I mentioned earlier on, communication is not in isolated words or isolated verses. It's a flow. And to that end, when reading the scriptures, we ought to be able to understand the language. We ought to be able to understand the way in which the sentences are flowing and the paragraphs are joined so the the, the thought that's being communicated stands out clearly uh, to us. And so on, on that particular basis, I would recommend a translation that you find easy to read, that makes sense to you, that is in our contemporary English idiom. 
Um, I'm quite sure that if the translators of the King James back in the 17th century were around today, they might, and I don't wish to cause any offense, so, <laughs> but they might say to us, we wrote this in the vulgar tongue, the common tongue of our day. We wanted to communicate the, what, what is written in Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic to people who speak English. And we want them to really understand what God has written, what God has given in his word. And we want them to understand it with a degree of, of force, poetic force, so that the metaphors really ring home and we've given careful attention to this. Why are you still reading <laughs> <laughs> this version is so many years old, you know, so many centuries old. You, sh you, you should read it in, in an idiom that is, is, is consistent with how you are today. Now, of course, the New King James is, is, is an effort to do this, and, it, and it's very good in that regard. The translation ought to be one that follows as closely as possible the original uh, languages. Uh, Greek, we don't have the original uh, writings, but we have copies of them. But, but follows the, the Hebrew and the Greek uh, text. But there are, there are two ways in which this can be handled. There are translations that take a, a literal uh, translation of, 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 of the uh, foreign text into the English language. And those translations can be a little wooden when it comes to reading. Um, they may be accurate in trying to convey uh, an English word to represent a particular Hebrew word, um, but they're not necessarily easy to read. And then there are other translations that follow a principle called dynamic equivalence. So you can take an expression uh, or a statement in the original language and bring it into an equivalent uh, statement in the English language. Now, both, translations will, both methods of translation will have their weaknesses. The, the, the literal translation may be a bit wooden and doesn't flow very well, doesn't make for an easy read. The dynamic equivalence requires judgments as to what the original text uh, means. And in some places... Uh, it's difficult to make a judgment that everyone will agree with, and so the translators have to settle upon what they believe is to be a faithful translation of, of, of that particular uh, Greek or Hebrew text. So given that, uh, the New American Standard is a good literal translation. Um, and if you want to do sort of an in-depth kind of a Bible study, looking at particular words, particular verses and that, that might be a good one. But if you were... Uh, doing general reading, I like the New International uh, Version. There's the Holman Christian Standard Bible. There's the um, ESV, the um, what's that called now? The English Standard Bible, which is a revision of the uh, of, of, uh, of the RSV, the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. These are modern translations. So we've got our own Baptist one, which you might prefer. Uh, the only niggle with that one is that <laughs> some uh, passages that are well known are translated in a different way than you might be familiar with. And that might just jar with you a little. It's not that the translators have, have done a bad job. They've done a very good job. But um, it, it's just that it, it, it may rank, rankle a little bit. Um, the gender neutrality in some of the modern translations is trying to accommodate us in our uh, contemporary setting. Um, and one can sympathize with the sentiment behind that. But then it can be a little problematic if one is trying to understand the relation between men and women and uh, one, between one another and our relation to God and all that's embraced within God's establishment of authority. And let me say this uh, at the outset, that it's very clear in the scriptures that, that God holds man and woman equally for, you know, Genesis describes how God makes us in his image, male and female, he made them. So, you know, there's, there's no disputes uh, about uh, equality at all. Um, and if one takes it even further still, um, the problem with the feminist movement is that they don't go far enough. The scriptures don't simply speak of equality, but they actually raise a woman yeah. uh, before uh, her husband, for he is her servant. <laughs> right. You know, Eve is, is bone of bone, of, of Adam's bone. He's flesh, she's flesh of his flesh. And he is to serve her. And Christ presents himself as one who, in the writing of the apostle Paul, Ephesians, uh, who, 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 who loves his wife and who's given himself for his wife. And the husbands are love their wives in the same way. And the gender distinctions, when understood in this kind of a way, take on an entirely different uh, light 
that the, the, the man is to serve his wife, is to love his wife, is to ensure that she flourishes, that she is under the blessing of God as she walks in the light of the word of God and so on. And he exemplifies that life in his own life. So the gender neutra- neutrality, I think, can sort of miss some of the emphases that might come out by keeping the gender distinctions that are there in the original scriptures, with keeping it in mind all the time that it is sin that perverts the human relation between men and women. Uh, It is not Christianity. Uh, So uh, a modern translation for reading it easily. I don't like the Amplified Bible, which gives you a variety of translations of individual words, because a word has meaning in particular context. And simply knowing all the different ways in which a particular word can be translated is not helpful. You need to understand how that word is to be understood in the particular context. So the Amplified Bible may be of some use in some studies, but I wouldn't recommend it for general reading. And then there are Bibles that are paraphrases, which may be of help for someone who has um, uh, 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 difficulty with reading and, and needs some help with uh, English comprehension. Uh, that can be of some help to get them going, but they're a bit like the stabilizers on a bicycle. Once a person to learn to ride the bicycle, mm-hmm. then they can move move on from there. So for example, with myself, when I first became a believer, um, uh, my understanding of Christianity was very, very, very poor. And I, I, I read the Living Bible. It was helpful for me. Uh, it helped me to, to comprehend what the scriptures are about. And then I moved on to uh, a, a more accurate uh, translation because the, the likes of the paraphrases can lead you into error if you try to form judgments about God and how mm-hmm. to live before him. Exactly. Um, here's a question that's come in. It's kind of a... Uh, <clears throat> The Bible and evangelism. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question here has to do with the fact that there are a lot of Muslims in the community of Starkville. Uh, This is a question from a person who um, was a Muslim and and now is a believer. And the question is, um, in an attempt to make disciples of Christ from those who presently are Muslims, what strategy would you suggest? How would you use Bible verses or what Bible verses would you use to kind of help a Muslim see that Jesus is the Savior? Mm -hmm. Yeah. um, Maybe you might be able to work out where I'm going to answer this question anyhow, given what I've already said. And that is, I wouldn't want to necessarily pull out individual verses, but I'd want to help a person to to read the scriptures because it is in the reading of God's word through the work of the Spirit of God that a person is brought face to face with the person of Jesus Christ. That what a person needs to become aware of is who Christ is, whether they're Muslim, Buddhist, atheist, or whatever. It's to see Jesus Christ. And our conviction as God's people is that if Christ is lifted up, then he will draw all people to himself. And he is very much lifted up within the scriptures, especially within the gospels. And so for someone who wants to know who Christ is, whether he really is the prophet of God, whether he really is the one who reveals the truth about God and how we are to live before God, would be to present the entire narrative of of the life and teachings of Jesus Christ with the confidence that it is not the individual text of Scripture that will persuade a person to believe upon Christ, but rather seeing Jesus himself as he's revealed in the entire text of a gospel account or or the portion of the scriptures. So I bring the focus there because it is Christ who we must embrace when we come to faith in God. Um, We we must see that he is the prophet. He is the Messiah. He is God with us. Mm. 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 That's right. Um, Another question, this is kind of a nuts and bolts question, but you know, in in a lot of Bibles you have cross references, you have uh, notes at the bottom. And so the question that's come in is, is how would you recommend approaching that? Would you, would you recommend approaching um, reading the passage and then going back? Or as you read and you see a little A on verse 12 to go immediately down to the bottom and, sure. and see what it says about A. I, I would read the passage first of all yeah. and then uh, go back and then look at the cross-references. And the cross-references can be quite helpful in bringing out parallel passages that elucidate further the particular passage that you're looking at. But just, just pull in the sweep of it first of all, and then go back, otherwise you'll get ground down in the nitty-gritty fine details, and you'll miss the wood for the trees. So just read it, and trust that God, the Holy Spirit, will bring home to you the primary message. You may not be able to unearth every little gem that's there in the past, that doesn't matter. Because the things that God calls us to do are the most eminently simple and straightforward of things to do. Trust him. Mm, mm. There we are. 
I've cured all your anxiety. Just simply trust him. He's the almighty one. He's in control. Thou dost keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. The scriptures are so clear that the simplest of persons, the youngest of persons can read them and comprehend who God is. Don't make it complicated. Keep it simple. And then once you've grasped and enjoyed the simplicity of living before God, go and then turn over the other stones and see what there is there. With turning over stones, another question that's come in is the question about genealogies. Ah, and right. how to approach the genealogies. Yeah. Would your answer to that be the commentaries? I mean, that, yeah, you could do that, or you could use it as an opportunity to improve your English language as you try and pronounce <laughs> those <laughs> very difficult names. Um, and, uh, and yet, no, the genealogies, again, um, you can sweep those in. Um, so, for example, if you take the New Testament genealogies, they're trying to bring out simple points, and a commentary will help you identify this straight away. So you'll have a genealogy that traces um, Jesus Christ back to David to show that he's the son of David, to show that he's the fulfillment of the promise that God made to David. So in 2 Samuel uh, 7, uh, God promises uh, uh, David that he will uh, make his kingdom an everlasting kingdom, that a descendant of his will build the temple of God. Now immediately, the descendant of David who built the temple of God was Solomon. But that prophecy was not fulfilled in Solomon, but in the son of David, Jesus Christ, who builds the temple of God, not out of stones, but out of living stones, out of you and me, a temple which is erected, that is filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Um, so, you know, you, you have uh, these kinds of uh, uh, connections. Um, I've forgotten where I was going now. Just give me the question again. <laughs> For a how, to approach, how to approach genealogies. Oh, genealogies, yeah, that's yeah. right. Genealogies, yeah, okay. Uh, so that, that's one that you, it's traced back to, 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 uh, <coughs> to David in showing the fulfillment of, of prophecies. Or you can take another one. If you read um, in Genesis 5, it gives a, a genealogy from Adam. Um, and, it, and, and, and as you're reading through, you know, they, they live you know, 700 years and he died. 800 years and he died. 900 years and he died. 600 years and he died. And you're going through the genealogy, and he died, 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 except for one who gets taken up to the Lord. And, and the point there is simple, that sin brings death. That, 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 that man who is made in the image of God does not live in this particular physical entity forever. And, and that, 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 that sin has this serious consequence. And it is something intrinsic to all of us uh, that, that we have a sense that death is not right. Um, that's why we find it so difficult and so painful. Uh, even though we can rationalize that it is a reality that permeates our lives, it just doesn't seem right. And the genealogy brings out the reality that sin brings death. But the one who is, is brought into God's presence gives us hope in that God raises people to life. And we know ultimately in the fulfillment of the scriptures that we are raised to life in Christ Jesus. So death is not the end for the believer but rather that we continue to live with God through Christ in the company of God's people forever. So the genealogies don't have to be complicated. They, they bring home simple truths, either tracing the fulfillment of a prophecy and showing how that's fulfilled in Jesus Christ or driving home a simple point. Yeah. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, there's not really much more that you can do with them yeah. unless you're interested in history. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, And sometimes a simple point, mm. for instance, in the gene genealogy mm. of Christ is that God uses very imperfect people Absolutely. to accomplish so you, his purposes. Yeah. Indeed. And uh, you know, that's helpful for us as well because we may feel as though we've got to be perfect in order to be useful to God. And yet our God is not ashamed to own those whose histories are in some ways sordid. And that speaks volumes for how we, you can apply that then to your, your living in relation to others. That, you know, if God loves and embraces those who might mar the reputation of God because of the kind of background there, then how do I relate to other people? Do I distance myself from those who I think will in some way mar my reputation? Or am I willing to reach out with the love of God, with the reality of Christ to those around me? Uh, knowing that, you know, this is how my God has acted, I act similarly. So yeah. they can bring out those practical points yeah. too. Mm. I want to give mm. one final question that comes from them, and then I want to give you just a few sure. minutes. But, um, you know, you look around the room and you see diff people of different ages and people who are at different ages in the faith. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of the people who are in the room 
I would say a good number of those who are in the room probably have grown up in church, have been in church most of their lives, and have known from very early ages the importance of reading the Bible, and probably, I would say, are familiar with a lot of at least the uh, more famous passages. Probably most everybody in the room knows about David and Goliath and Daniel in the lion's den, etc. And so I think a question from the congregation that I'd like for you to address is for, it, it, it sounds blasphemous. The question sounds blasphemous, but you, you know it's where okay. I'm going. Yeah. The, the question would be, I've been a Christian for a long time, and every year I have made the New Year's resolution that I'm going to do better at knowing God and reading the Scripture. How, after all of these years, can I read passages that I've read over and over again and keep the fascination and wonder in the text? Okay. Keep it from getting old hat. Mm -hmm. Well, consider in the first place that the Scriptures are a revelation of God. And in particular, a revelation of Jesus Christ. And now, in coming to the scriptures, the first question that ought to be there in our mind that we seek to answer is, what is being revealed about God in this particular passage? Who is my God? Who is my Lord? Uh, and if we keep the focus upon our God, uh, then the Spirit of God, whose work is to make Christ known to us, who makes the Father known to us, will help us in seeing what we may not have seen before. And that the love of God will drive us, the love of Christ will drive us through those passages that we might be familiar with to see even more clearly what we may not have seen before. And it's a bit like this. You know, if, if you're a, um, a musician and you're starting off, there may be certain elements of music that you are aware of, but the more expert you become in the practice of music, the more discerning you will be in the hearing of music and be able to bring out uh, more nuances that simply passed by you before. And the scriptures are like this. They are, they are without you know, a depth that we can plummet, they, they continue to, to be profound. And so the more we know of God, and it's not just head knowledge, it has to be experiential. The more we know of him, the more we will be able to, to learn about him as we look at the passages that we've seen before. For example, I've, I've been going through the prophets for a few years uh, uh, with uh, the congregation that I pastor. And the prophets are immensely repetitive. And you know, from a pastoral point of view, you think when you come into the, the scriptures, hmm, what am I going to do with this passage? <laughs> it seems to be saying the same thing. But there are, there are, are nuances in each consecutive passage in the major prophets and then into the minor prophets that bring out yet another facet of who our God is. And this is the thrill of this living relationship with the living God. And furthermore, take it one day at a time. Mm. You know, read the scriptures, meditate upon the scriptures. Now, by meditate, it is a matter of, 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 of using the intellect to grasp hold of what God has revealed of himself and then the significance of this. And there is no topic that we can dwell upon more uh, usefully than the gospel itself. We often think that the gospel is for unbelievers to get them into the church. They must hear about Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ died for sinners and get them into the church. But the gospel is for the church if you really think about it and trace it through. And the implications of the gospel are, are immense. Uh, God has forgiven me my sins. My grievous rebellion against him, my, my grievous neglect of his majesty, of his honor, of his goodness. He's forgiven me my sins. Therefore, what right do I have in my relation to others to hold their sins against them? If he can bear with me, if he can love me so deeply, if he in all the perfection of his majesty can give his son and bear my sin, then can I not rest others in the hands of my God and respond to them as ones who are made in the image of God, knowing that God, having forgiven me my sins, I have a rational, concrete ground basis to forgive them uh, their sins. And so, you know, there is a freshness that ought to be there each day. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies are new every morning. And those mercies are mercies that bring us the grace to live yet another day with our Lord. And 
the most mundane of passages will illuminate when we come before the scriptures in that way. But if I simply come to the scriptures to think, what can I get out of this? What has the Lord got in this for me? Is there a word for me? Well, the answer is the word is Jesus Christ. So focus upon who God is, and then if you see who God is, then the application will come from that. It will naturally come. Uh, and in that way, hopefully, those of you who have walked with the Lord for many a year will find a revitalization in the reading of Scripture. Think about Isaiah, how those of us who are older in years will rise with the eagle's wings. Is this not true? Should we conceive that as we get older, we get slower and duller and less useful? No. With the years of experience and hopefully a degree of humility in, in, in walking before the Lord and living before others, we can accomplish by the grace of God, through the Spirit of God, uh, a representation of him, a service for him in the very lives that we live. It is not youth that, that, that transforms the church or builds the church. It is those who are filled with the Spirit of God, walking with the Lord Jesus Christ humbly, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So think of yourself in the older years of your life that you're just coming into the blossoming years of your life an exercise of vigor in your living before the Lord and let that overflow. May you be more overflowing than those who are younger in years with the love of the Lord because that love has been matured over the years. So it's a well that's deep. Drink deeply from it and never underestimate the magnitude of the Lord's grace towards those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. We've got just a couple of more minutes and so I wanted to just give you the floor. Mm. And so... What would be your encouragement to those who are here mm -hmm. regarding the study of the scripture? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there the are two ways in which we can look at this. One way that we've been thinking about, and that is very much in the experiential sense. And uh, in that regard, I would reiterate, uh, come to the scriptures with a focus upon God. Behold your God. Make that the primary focus. And think about this. Some of you um, have been uh, highly academically trained. Uh, you're in areas of specialism. You may be a, a medical doctor, you may be an engineer, you may be a chemist, you may be whatever it may be. And you've given years of study, years of thought, years of effort to understand the things that you understand, to, to form the relations that you have. Well, when we come to the scriptures, we should apply the same kind of rigor, the same kind of attention. And the more we apply ourselves, the more we will receive from the very word itself. The scriptures are potent to promote our well-being if we steadfastly give ourselves to them. But the benefit of the scriptures is that we, we come to them to read them and to apply them. Lord, how can I love you more? How can I serve you more? How can I show with my life the gratitude that I owe to you because of what you have given to me? And those who so seek the Lord will find the Lord. And those who so knock on the Lord's door will find it open. And there before them will be the Lord Jesus Christ. So come steadfastly, come deeply, come faithfully to the word of God. Think upon it in its application to your life and be satisfied with nothing less than being able to say, for me to live is Christ. And as I said earlier on, Meditate upon the word that the Lord has given you through your pastor. That's God's gift to you. It's manna from above. Draw out all the juices of what he has labored in the word to bring before you. For God speaks through him. God ministers to you through him. He is the servant of the Lord, selected by the Lord to minister to you in this very circumstance. And you will find as you humbly receive what the Lord says through him with all his weaknesses and fallibilities and all the rest of it, you will find that his word is spoken perfectly through imperfect agents and thereby you will be strengthened in the faith. Live for Christ who is presented to you most preeminently within the scriptures. Christianity is not a set of assertions. It's a relation with the living God and we present Christ, not steps to peace with God, but the one who is the peace of God. But to do that, we must know him. So read the scriptures to the end that you know and understand the love of God to you and are overwhelmed by that love so that love expresses itself in your life, in all the circumstances. And then what change we might see within our society as Christ is manifested within the church.
Okay. Thank you so much mm. for being our guest. And mm. for you, aren't you glad to know that there's a professor at Campus of Mississippi State who loves the scripture like this? You can see why his classes are always filled. And uh, what an incredible blessing to all of those students who are in those classes who have the opportunity to, to learn about God through the Scripture. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you very much. And thank you all for being here. We appreciate you taking your time tonight to, to come and, and, and ask questions and, and listen. And we always want you to know, if you ever have a question about something that you're reading in the Scripture, please feel free to contact me or one of our staff members we would love to help you. In fact, the helping you helps us. So please always feel free to ask a question uh, because we want you to come to love the Word of God because as has been wisely put, it is a revelation of God. And ultimately, our desire is for us all to love God deeply because He certainly is worthy of our, of our love and affection. Um, let me pray. And uh, don't forget, if you brought a child, to please pick that child up before you leave. <laughs> All right? Uh, let me pray, and then we will dismiss. Our Father, we bow before you here tonight, and we praise you, because we've been reminded of how wonderful you are, and, and you are. You are Almighty God. And everything in this world, including every person in this room, belongs to you. When we wake up in the morning, and we begin our Monday, that Monday is a gift from you. And it's to be lived for your glory. And so, Father, I pray that you will help us to approach tomorrow maybe differently than we approached last Monday. Help us to truly, as Paul exhorted us, to be living sacrifices every single day. And, Father, I pray that as each person in this room, as we begin a new day and we open up your word and we study the scripture, Father, I pray that you will help us to see the wonder of who you are and that you will help us to see the wonder of who you desire us to be. And help us, O oh Lord, to align ourselves under you, for you are God. We are the sheep of your pasture. And Father, we pray um, for us to, uh, to really understand, for our eyes to be opened to uh, the wonder of who you are as revealed in Scripture, and that it affects every single aspect of our lives. It affects our relationships affects our job performance, affects our uh, lives as students and how we invest our days uh, on campus. Father, thank you for Albert Bisson. Thank you for uh, saving him. Thank you for leading him to the states. Thank you for leading him to Mississippi State University. And we pray your blessing on him as he stands before those students each and every day. And I pray that you will use him to draw people to you as he presents um, the greatness of the revelation of your word. Father, thank you for the church, for allowing us the opportunity to assemble together, and the opportunity to learn from each other and to be encouraged by one another. And Father, again, we owe you everything. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for all that you've done. Uh, and Father, we praise you, we love you, we thank you. And it is in your name we pray, amen. Thanks for coming.